Welcome back. This is most probably the most difficult panel of the day after <laughs> lunch. And therefore, it's even more appreciated that you are all back up here and had a good coffee, hopefully, already. But I'm sure that this panel will excite you and you will certainly freshen up immediately. It is my great pleasure to introduce this panel that is titled How to Build a Space Ecosystem. And this session will start with a keynote um, uh, given by Val Munzami. And you know him already, I <laughs> don't need to introduce him. And the panel itself will be moderated by Peter Martinez, the executive director of the Secure World Foundation. So Val, the, the, the word is yours, or okay, do you want to start, Peter? Peter? Good, Peter. Th thank you, Christian. Um, Welcome back from lunch. I know it's always uh, hard to be the, the first um, panel after lunch, so I appreciate you making the, the effort to get here so that we could start on time. So welcome to the fourth plenary on the topic of how to build a space ecosystem. My name is Peter Martinez. I'm the executive director of Secure World Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to be your moderator this afternoon. As you all know, the golden thread running through this uh, GLEC conference is summed up with two words space ecosystem. And if you look this up in, in a dictionary, you'll see that in general terms, an ecosystem is defined as a complex network of um, or, or an interconnected system in which the various elements interact with each other in many different ways. And we've heard about the various component elements over the last two days. For an emerging space country just starting to develop its national space arena. How does one begin to develop that complex interconnected network? How do you work? How do you weave together the policy, the regulatory, industrial, financial, human capital, and other strands to begin to form this ecosystem? What kinds of equities are required to establish such an ecosystem? And how can we build in robustness so that the ecosystem is sustainable over the long term? What can we learn from establishing ecosystems in other domains? Those are the sorts of questions that we will be focusing on in this panel. And we have a stellar lineup of speakers with a lot of experience across various dimensions of our topic. First, to set the scene for us, is my distinguished friend, colleague, and compatriot, Val Munsami, who needs no introduction uh, by this stage of the conference, so <laughs> all protocols observed, Val. Um, Val will set the scene for us by giving a, um, a presentation that will last some 15 minutes. Following this, we will move straight on into a, a moderated discussion, and I will now uh, proceed to introduce our distinguished panelists. Starting from your left, uh, first up, Gabriela Arrigo. She is the Director of International Affairs at the Italian Space Agency, ASI. She's also the ASI representative to the European Space Policy Institute and ISU. Um, she's uh, a vice president of the, uh, she was a vice president of the IAF from 2018 to 2020. Greg Autry, next up is um, Clinical Professor of Space Leadership, Policy and Business in the Thunderbird School of Global Management and a visiting professor at Imperial College London. In 2016, he served on the NASA Agency Review and then as White House Liaison at NASA in 2017. And he currently serves as chair of the Safety Working Group on the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, um, otherwise uh, commonly referred to as Comstack in the US at the FAA and as vice president of the National Space Society. Next, Michal Brichter. He is the co-founder of the Slovak Space Office and head of its industry branch, working under the Slovak Investment and Trade Development Agency. The Slovak Space Office is the national contact point for foreign space agencies, associations, as well as businesses and research entities. In 2019, Michal initiated a new strategic approach and a set of government-driven activities to steer the comprehensive development of the Slovak space sector and enhance its internationalization. Next we have Ian Grosner. Uh, Mr. Ian Grosner is a federal attorney in Brazil since 
2022, he has been serving as legal counsel and deputy head at the Legal Services Department of the Brazilian Space Agency, and he is based at its headquarters in Brasilia. Next up, we have Natavan Hasanova. She is the Director of Strategic Development and Planning at Azur Cosmos. Her role at the agency is to align processes, resource planning, and department goals with overall strategy to develop new projects and space programs. And she has prepared the Strategic Development Plan of Azur Cosmos and is working to develop the National Space Strategy. And last but not least, Mr. Guillermo Salvatierra. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the, the um, National Space Activities Commission, CONAI. Um, he is an uh, International Affairs Advisor to the Minister of Science and Technology and Innovation of Argentina, and also an advisor to the CEO of INVAP, a very large um, industry player in Argentina. Previously, Mr. Salvatierra served as president of the National Institute of Industrial Technology. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished lineup of speakers today with rich experience across many of the areas in the topics of our panel today. And um, I will shortly hand over the floor to Val for his presentation. But before doing so, just to remind you that if you have questions, you can post them on the Slido platform and they will be fed through to me here on the podium. So without further ado, Val, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Peter. And, um, Welcome to the panel members as well. I'm going to step from here and do my presentation. Yeah. So the keynote is around how to build a uh, space ecosystem. So I thought I'd take just three key focus areas in terms of packing the presentation together. The one is, let's define the ecosystem so we know what we are talking about. So it's a little bit of feedback. Yeah. Then highlight the principles by which you uh, put the ecosystem together, so that relates to the, the how part, but from a principal point of view. And then I'll use a demonstration to show you how you pull the ecosystem together. Okay. So let's start. Um, Peter sort of introduced it in terms of um, indicating that this is a complex system. And actually the word ecosystem is an ecological system. It's biological, animals, plants, the environment, all of them acting and interacting in concert to take a certain input, translate that, and have a certain output out of that. Okay? So that's the genesis of the ecological system. Now there's certain attributes of the biological or ecological system that we want to emulate when we're looking at any ecosystem. In this case, a space ecosystem. So diversity is an asset. So you've got very different elements coming together, but they have to interact but it is an asset because you're bringing them together. There's interdependence, there's diversity, and there's complexity. There's economies of scale as well. In terms of national systems of innovation, this is what we're trying to achieve, is performance of the ecosystem is greater than the sum of the performance of its constituent elements. Okay? That's the whole idea of the ecosystem. There's also role differentiation in the ecosystem. Boundaries established based on functionality, scale, and limits. So the industry might doing a, might define its particular scope and role within the ecosystem, the, in, um, you know, the universities or the academia, and so on. So there's different functions within the ecosystem for different elements. Then there's mutual benefits, so all of them working in tandem to create the benefit for the entire ecosystem. And ultimately what you want to do is have a co-creation, so you're working together, development parts leading to succession and co-evolution. So in this particular lecture or keynote, I'm looking at the how, how to build it, but also to be mindful that the ecosystem is not static. It's actually evolving over time. Okay, so it matures over time. So there's a co-creation between all of the partners or the elements in the ecosystem that ensure there's an evolution. And then self-organization. If you look at an ecosystem, it's self-organized. Okay? And there's balancing through flexibility, stability, and sustainability. So let's look at the space ecosystem in terms of defining the space ecosystem so we know exactly what we're talking about. I'm going to stop at, start at the top end and then work my way backwards. So ultimately, the success of your space program, or your space ecosystem, is how efficiently you can push out products and services in the fourth thematic domain, whether it's Earth observation, 
communications, navigation, positioning, and timing, and even space exploration, because even uh, research-based exploration is a service in some way producing data that goes to the researchers that use it and generate new knowledge. But in order to do that, to give effect to that, you need the human capital. So you need universities, academia coming in, training engineers, uh, technicians, students, and so on. So that gets absorbed into the system, and they go where they're actually required, whether it's the industry, agency, looking after the infrastructure. Then you have an infra uh, industry support base. Now, industry, the new space is very key and critical for the ecosystem. You also have an infrastructure value chain that actually gives effect to producing those products and services. And then you have international partnerships that are very key for collaboration, obviously, but you have inbound knowledge transfer and outbound knowledge transfer as well. So spin-in, spin-out, uh, and that's very key in terms of the various partnerships, not only international, but inside of the ecosystem as well. And sorry you can't see it, but it's behind the panel members. But at a daily activity level, you know, whether it's in an agency or a university, essentially when you're trying to move your value chain into the products and services, you start by looking at mission requirements. You do mission analysis and design, and then you do a little bit of enabling technologies, and that's your research, development, and innovation pipeline that's pushing out the technologies that they actually require for the particular mission. And then there's mission operations. So once the technology is um, more or less developed and you launch it, you've got to operate it. And then ultimately, it's space applications, which feed back to the top layer. And to frame all of this and to pull it together, you need space legislation at a national or regional level, but also specific policies, priorities of the region or priorities of the country. And at the bottom, and sorry, you can't see it, but it talks about strategy and business models. So there's a specific business model inside of the, the ecosystem, whether it's commercial or whether you want to get autonomy, and there's very different elements. Now, the one thing to notice is that this ecosystem is not simple by any means. It's very complex because all of these different elements are actually interacting with each other. So it's a highly complex ecosystem. So there's certain principles for solving complexity, which I wanted to demonstrate. But the idea about solving complexity, you actually have to solve it layer by layer. Okay? And then the second, by solving layer by layer, you actually align the various elements and you consolidate it into the ecosystem. So layer by layer, align it, Consolidate means lock it into the ecosystem. So here I've got a little model of a Rubik's Cube. On your left hand side, your left, my right, <laughs> uh, that is mixed up, okay? So in that particular state, we can refer to it as being suboptimal in terms of impact, it's inefficient. And by the way, many organizations are reflective of what's on the left. And there's a lot of effort put in terms of moving that into the right. The cube on the right is essentially representing an ecosystem that has optimal impact and is very efficient. Okay? And that's what we're all aspiring to in terms of building the ecosystem. And so we want to transform this ecosystem on the left and move it towards the right, even as we build it. I want to use a Rubik's Cube, but there's certain properties of a Rubik's Cube that is very interesting. First of all, there's 27 pieces to the Rubik's Cube. The corner pieces, the top corner, there's eight of them, they have three different colors. The side pieces, and there are 12 of them, they have two colors, okay? The second property is, sorry, I've got a Rubik's Cube right here. The center pieces are fixed. You can mix up this Rubik's Cube however you like. The orange is always opposite the red. The white opposite the yellow. The green opposite the blue. Okay? And so those centerpieces are fixed. And there's a certain sequence. For example, you get orange, green, red, and blue. Okay? So if I look at it from that particular perspective. So the sequencing is fixed as well. So that's something you should know if you're gonna uh, uh, look at solving uh, a complex system like this. And what I would refer to the centerpieces as, as your mandate of your ecosystem. 
And normally your mandate is set by legislation, your objectives, your functions, your policy priorities. Okay? We had a whole day workshop on the space policy masterclass. Why are you building this ecosystem? And uh, Gorela, you presented that as well in your presentation. The, second, the third property of the Rubik's Cube, which makes it highly complex, if you take these 27 pieces, and the number of ways you can mix this Rubik's Cube is 43 quintillion. It's 43 times 10 to the 18. You wouldn't think a simple system like this at that level of complexity. And just by the way, the number of sand particles on planet Earth is 7.5 quintillion. This is 43. There's more ways you can mix this Rubik's Cube than the number of sand particles on the Earth. And just if you yeah, mathematically inclined, that's the equation. I can explain it to you later. Okay. So let's start building the ecosystem. So the first thing when you building a space ecosystem, you've got to put down the space law and policy. Now if you think of a physical building, you're building a foundation. You've got an engineering design, you dig up your trenches, and that's putting down the scope of your building. Okay. So what I do, I'm going to put a, essentially you start off with a cross, your foundation. I'm going to build the first line, knowing full well that the orange is opposite the red. Okay? So here's a white line. That's my foundation. That's my policy, my legislation that I've marked it down. The second line that runs across, oops, sorry. You can't see it but it's a strategy and business model, okay? So I know that the green goes opposite the blue. So I've now got a cross with orange. Sorry, have I got it in the right sequence? I'm flipping the image in my head so I can present it. Um, yeah, so I've got orange, green, red, and blue. In a particular sequence. Now this is where we need to align these colors with the center. And I just rotated, I've aligned it, and I've locked it into position. So I've aligned my policy, my law, my strategy, and my business models with the mandate that is given me, given to us to build this ecosystem. Now as I said, you've got to build this thing layer by layer. The first layer, you align and you consolidate. Now the thing that I'm left with is my corner pieces, right? And just so that you know what the corner piece is, it's your building blocks. You need the human capital, you need the exper expertise, you need the industry, you need the infrastructure, you need the partnerships, okay? And in terms of a building, it's like the pillars of the building. It's holding the entire structure together, okay? If there's any weakness in this, then your ecosystem is gonna be weak as well. And what I do is, for example, there's actually one that's corner that's solved, right? And the way I solve the other corners is, for example, I've got a green and a red on this, this side. And I find the color that actually goes into the bottom. And I put it on the top, so I align it to where it needs to go. And immediately if I align it, I can consolidate it. It's locked, okay? So I can do the, the other colors as well. So here's another one, locked, okay? So I keep doing that, I'm gonna, I've got one more to go, and locked. I solved the first layer. All right. So that is the pillar for your ecosystem. I now need to solve the second layer. So what is the second layer? When you wanna translate and use that resources that's given you, you gotta to go to your daily set of activities, your mission requirements, your research development, your operations of the system, building your applications. And the way to do that is again alignment and consolidation. So for example, I need to solve this, the side pieces. And what I do is I take a side piece and I align it to make, a, for example, a red line here. And once I align it, I need to lock it, right? So that's now locked. So the way to solve the cube is constantly align, consolidate, align, consolidate. Solve, I've got two more sides to solve. And one more, sorry, I just need to get it out quickly. So 
So the second layer is salt. <laughs> okay. Remember, layer by layer, align, consolidate, align, consolidate. So I've now aligned my daily set of activities within that framework using the resources and I've locked it into the ecosystem. Ultimately, what I want to do is to develop the products and services. And the way to do that in the top layer is to get my yellow cross. And so I'll start by looking for the yellow cross. I'll get one line sorted out. Okay, so there's a, a yellow line and I need to get the cross section for that. And now I've just messed it up. <laughs> I'll do that again. Okay, so I've got one line, and then I'll get my second line. So you can see I've got a yellow cross, right? So again, it's all about aligning, consolidating, aligning and consolidating. There's something very interesting in this configuration. Sorry, on the second layer, when you're looking at your daily activities, the thing that I, I should have mentioned is you'll see the color coordination follows a certain sequence. It's the same thing with your value chain of activities. You have to follow a certain coordination or sequence. You define your mission, then you get into the R&D. Once the platform is up and running, you do your mission operations. You can't do mission operations without doing the mission analysis, without actually doing the R&D, okay? So in this instance, I'm producing my products and services at the top end, but I'm having a problem. So you'll notice here, the green is aligned, orange is aligned, but I'm having a problem with the blue. So it's almost like in an organization or an ecosystem where you have a value chain of activities, certain parts of activities are aligned into the ecosystem and others are not. So if you look at a value chain, the value chain is only as strong as your weakest link. If you have a weakest weak link in your value chain, it means the entire value chain is corrupted or is, is reducing the impact. Okay. So I've got two that's sorted. I need to sort out the other two. And here I just put the alignment. It's the orange, the green, the red, and the blue. So what am I left with? I haven't described anything else to you when I looked at the ecosystem. And it's interesting because the earlier conversation on the GNF this morning was governance, compliance, and risk. Okay. And Christopher is sitting there that moderated this particular session. And the way to do, I, I essentially have four corners left. Again, it's the, I'm solving the top layer, and I've got a line, and I've got to consolidate. And I'll explain to, just now to you what the alignment and consolidation looks like. I've, I've got to put the particular piece in that corner in the right place. I've got orange and green, it's in the right place, but I can tell you right now, the other three are out of sync. They're not in the right place. So that's fine, I'll put it in the right place. So I've got all four corners in the right place, but they're not locked in, they're not in the right orientation, okay? And actually, it's only one that's in the correct orientation. So what I do is I start solving side by side. So just to give you a sense. So I've solved one side, then I go and solve the other side. That's my rubric skip solved. Okay. Now, as I said, the four top corners is your governance, compliance, and risk. But I haven't described anything in detail around governance, compliance, and risk. So I'll just spend the next slide just explaining to you what we mean by governance, compliance, and risk. Essentially, when you are an executive or you're sitting on the board of uh, directors, what you're actually doing is you're defining a set of boundaries in terms of governance, compliance, and risk. So what actually defines those boundaries? It's your system level policies that you have to implement. There's a set of legislation. You have objectives and functions that are given to certain institutions. You've got to abide by that. There's a strategy at the implementation agency level and there's also function, functional level policies. For example, you have policies on HR, or supply chain management, or how you deal with your finances. And so what you're doing with these various policies, legislation, strategy, is you're actually defining a boundary, okay? And 
Essentially, when you are called on as a board of directors to oversee the governance of an institution, and sometimes, you know, some of you are executives here, board of directors seem to come in and have a wrong impression. They've got to wield a stick and hit you on the head, essentially. And sometimes it frays the relationship. But actually, board of directors are meant to ensure that the executive team stays within the boundaries. Okay? The problem arises is when the executive team steps out of the boundaries. Then you're becoming non-compliant. And you're then introducing certain elements of the risk. And those are the two areas where the executive team are stepping out of the bound. And this is very important. Like in South Africa, uh, when President Mandela came to office, he called uh, Judge Mervyn King. And he said, I want you to come up with a code of conduct that companies and institutions can abide by that ensures that we have good governance. And so we now have the fourth iteration called the King Four Code of Conduct, which all institutions have to com uh, comply with. And so, for example, from an auditing purposes, we talk about materiality and significance framework. You know, for example, if you've got a hundred million dollar budget, you're not allowed to step outside by two percent, let's say. So, if you have irregular and wasteful expenditure, the threshold is two percent. If you step over, you get an audit finding. The same with, uh, from an audit, a good governance perspective. Sorry, I think the air is, the altitude is starting to kick in. From a good governance, you have various lines of defense that we talk about from an auditing perspective. Your first line of defense is your executives. Then you might have an internal audit function that comes and audits you regularly to see if you're staying in the boundary. You have a board of directors that's meant to see that you stay inside of that boundary. And then you have external auditors that come in. And they can be a pain sometimes, uh, but the whole idea of the exercise is to see that you stay within that boundary. So just the last slide, um, I think I mentioned to f quite a few colleagues, is that we established an African Space Leadership Institute in the last week. Because what I've demonstrated to you is the process, and we haven't gone into any level of detail around how you actually articulate the various elements. So for example, space policy and law. We had a full day workshop, and there was a rich information flowing out of that. And there's a process in which you define policies and strategy. So what we will be doing in this particular institute is to build toolboxes that will help you to build space policy, strategy, and so on. And this is my last slide. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks very much, Val, for that uh, very stimulating presentation. I don't think I've ever been in a presentation where somebody solved a Rubik's Cube while they were talking, so great. <laughs> um, okay, so with, with that um, uh, excellent scene-setting presentation, I'd now like to go straight into the moderated discussion. And I'd like to ask each of our panelists, starting with Gabriella and working our way um, down the row, um, to ask, to, to say in one sentence, how would you define a sustainable space ecosystem? Thank Peter. So in my, uh, on the basis of my experience, I would say that uh, a sustainable space uh, ecosystem uh, is uh, the space uh, community and uh, its environment where uh, the space government uh, is able uh, to uh, elaborate and define uh, its own uh, space uh, policy, uh, its space strategy, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the national space plan. Thank you. Greg? A uh, sustainable space uh, environment is one that delivers more value back to humanity and the planet than it takes to run it. That's, that's a great, great definition. Michal? So I would say that sustainable space ecosystem is ecosystem that uh, utilizes the full potential of stakeholders involved and at the same time diversifies risks, whether we talk about uh, markets, domains of activities, or financial sources. Okay, great. So you're introducing the element of risk um, as well. Great. Ian? Oh, uh, before that, uh, draft a view is much easier than do that. So, <laughs> yeah, so definitely. So. Um, Space and sustainability are concepts that are almost uh, synonymous, right? Uh, the space sector um, must be a factor of development. 
uh, in order to enable a sustainable business with leading space industry, uh, we generate jobs and income, promote responsible behavior. This is an important part, promoting responsible behavior. Thank you. Natavan, how would you define sustainable mm -hmm. space ecosystem? Sustainable <coughs> uh, space ecosystem is about ensuring all humanity uh, use outer space for peaceful purposes and meanwhile have socioeconomic benefits now and in long run. Okay, so, thanks. so the um, uh, intergenerational aspect and, and all, all of humanity. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and um, Guillermo. Um, well, a sustainable space ecosystem would be the, the ecosystem that has the, the capability to adapt to, to, the, to the changing context that the space sector is undergoing at this moment. Excellent. So the, the, the um, principle of adaption. So, so you see the very rich um, set of, of, of uh, thoughts that our panelists have just shared. Um, so, building then on, on Val's presentation, um, Val mentioned in his presentation that the first step is to start with a sort of a policy and, and law um, framework. So, Gabriela, starting with you, um, let's look at the policy aspects. What, what are the key elements of policy for a space ecosystem? And in, in particular, what, in your experience, are the elements of a sustainable space ecosystem? Okay, so um, first of all, let me uh, express uh, uh, my appreciation uh, for the keynote, uh, keynote speech of my friend uh, Val Monsami. And uh, okay, uh, I have uh, uh, already uh, the opportunity to uh, express my vision uh, during the uh, master class in uh, space policy and law. And uh, now I will try to add uh, some uh, uh, concept uh, to the uh, previous concept that uh, Val Tsunami <laughs> already expressed, uh, hoping uh, to avoid uh, <laughs> additional confusion. Uh, but in my experience, uh, uh, f mm, four are the pillars um, uh, important for to build up a, a sustainable uh, space uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, so you can see uh, uh, a scheme uh, um, uh, on the screen. Um, and the four pillars in my experience uh, are uh, the space governance, uh, the space policy, uh, the space uh, strategy, and uh, the space program. Um, what is the space governance? Uh, um, the space governance uh, uh, is the uh, interaction uh, between uh, uh, governmental uh, subject responsible for uh, uh, space activities uh, with other uh, main uh, subject, um, including the private ones, uh, such as uh, industry, uh, academy, or society in general, that uh, contribute uh, to the uh, elaboration and definition of the uh, national uh, space policy and the national uh, space uh, strategy. Uh, two, uh, the space uh, uh, policy. Uh, we can uh, define uh, uh, the space policy um, um, a governmental uh, national uh, uh, policy uh, that define uh, the space uh, uh, goals and uh, issues and answer uh, to the question which <laughs> and why uh, in the sense that uh, which uh, indicate uh, the goals uh, and the vision and why uh, explain uh, the reasons uh, uh, of the uh, um, politics uh, or rather the, uh, uh, the doctrine that uh, the country uh, gives is itself to uh, uh, support uh, uh, its uh, choices. In other, word, uh, in other words, um, uh, the, uh, the pasture that the country uh, wa the want to uh, play in the, in the space arena. Three, uh, the space strategy. Uh, the space strategy is uh, mm, a set of means and timing necessary uh, to achieve the goals uh, defined by the space policy. And uh, the space strategy answered uh, the question what 
and when, uh, what tools, uh, what uh, instruments, what uh, uh, measures, uh, and what times, uh, time frames are needed uh, to uh, implement uh, uh, the policy. Uh, when uh, uh, I mention uh, uh, means or measure, of course, uh, I uh, refer uh, to uh, different policies, as uh, uh, Tsunami mentioned before. Um, so, um, industrial policy, uh, scientific and technological policy, uh, education and capacity building policy, and of course, international cooperation uh, policy and, and so on. And fourth, the fourth pillar uh, is uh, the space program. So the space program is uh, the space uh, national space plan uh, that um, contain all project uh, initiatives, um, infrastructures, and of course related human and uh, uh, financial uh, resources uh, necessary to implement uh, uh, the strategy. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, often uh, uh, I find a lot of confusion uh, in the use uh, of these uh, uh, four uh, pillars and in the use uh, uh, often uh, of the competences in the sense uh, who does what. Uh, and uh, let me uh, add in this sense uh, maybe uh, an important uh, uh, element, uh, um, uh, the uh, space, the international uh, space cooperation, because uh, uh, this instrument, uh, uh, as we are uh, um, say in this uh, in these days uh, in this conference, uh, is very uh, important to uh, exchange experiences, uh, uh, to um, uh, facilitate. Uh, the dialogue and uh, therefore uh, to uh, support and uh, uh, accompany um, uh, the build up of the uh, uh, sustainable space uh, ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Um, so, mo moving on then, um, Greg, I understand that you've had a uh, leadership role in shaping the US space uh, agenda and regulatory environment in, in discussions that have taken place in the US. Uh, what are your thoughts on the key policy and regulatory elements for a sustainable space ecosystem? Yeah, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, you and all the subsequent panelists, let's try to keep to maximum two minutes of, of response so that we can work through all um, the questions. Certainly, and the, the Rubik's Cube uh, analogy inspires me. I remember when I gave my child a, a Rubik's Cube uh, the first time, and he took it, and he played with it for a while, looked at it. And then he realized that those little colored squares are actually stickers on the top of the plastic cube. So he peeled them all off and he moved them into the positions that he wanted. And I didn't do that. <laughs> having watched what's happened uh, in the US government and policy environment, which was very carefully shaped going back to the 1980s, we're suddenly realizing the entrepreneurs are peeling the, uh, the colors off of the cube. And, and, and we can believe that we sit in a world where very clever, smart people in governmental positions are going to define a policy in law environment and a national space strategy, but we're going to quickly find out that we are trying to keep up. That, that's a great analogy, Greg. I um, lo love the way you built onto the whole Rubik's Cube theme for Val's presentation. I guess it's a challenge to, to the rest of the panelists. Uh, Michal, uh, so if one talks about developing a space ecosystem, um, what um, financial and industrial development frameworks are there to, to use? Perhaps from other domains or mm -hmm. just from general experience? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, answering this uh, from uh, perspective of Slovakia, uh, to simply put on, on the experience that we gathered over the past few years, I would firstly develop uh, and divide it probably on two levels. First be the international level, uh, Slovakia being a European country, uh, integrating itself in ESA and integrated in EU. Uh, these two institutional players, of course, play a very important role in uh, the ecosystem development because through them, not just uh, financial resources are redistributed, but also they provide tremendous uh, development support in uh, various soft tools. So I would start with the institutional, uh, international level. Secondly, then uh, we have a, a variety of national tools. And here, of course, uh, it starts with uh, providing 
financial uh, possibilities to, to develop the project and uh, also not just directly providing finance but uh, helping to attract uh, uh, as well uh, private resources. But then again, a set of uh, soft tool uh, activities or soft tools that can uh, play a role in such development. Uh, I could name at least uh, three key that we identified in our work and that was the comprehensive uh, development and in integration of new stakeholders, either via uh, technological transfer and collaboration between academia business, either through uh, startup creation and new venture creation, but also through so-called spinning in, so attracting uh, uh, well-established non-space technological companies with uh, certain capabilities which are relevant. Secondly, then, it's definitely international collaboration because Space is uh, highly internationalized and it doesn't really make sense to do anything uh, on your own, especially if you're a small country. And uh, thirdly, and last but not least, uh, it's uh, definitely outreach as a tool. Uh, not just to, to uh, convince the, the more general public or to explain uh, the topics to more general public, but also to prepare the, the future talents. Thank you. Then building on that, um, uh, and I'll, I'll direct the next question to Natavan and uh, Guillermo. Um, in your opinion, um, and, and Greg as well, uh, in, your, in your opinion, what, what is the base infrastructure that should be in place to develop a space ecosystem? What are the key elements that need to be in place so that you can go down this road? Um, well, uh, in, in, in our experience, in the Argentinian experience, uh, well, we have a, 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 a national space programs with 30 years uh, that, that, that was born uh, 30 years ago. And the pillars were different pillars in, 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 in the beginning. We, we didn't have anything, uh, but what, what were the pillars in order to, to start? Well, the pillars were that Argentina ha, had uh, a very well-trained, uh, strong capabilities on, in, in the human resources side. And this is an infrastructure too, because you can you can get this kind of of human resources in ten minutes. Or you can hire this kind. Or you can hire a, a, the the complete uh, team that you need in order to to start uh, uh, with with the, with the plan. Um, <coughs> and we we we, we have at this time two uh, other pillar like uh, an an industrial base. In order to spin in, in some kind of capabilities from the from the industrial side uh, in, and, and attract these capabilities to the space uh, program, and, and we have two several uh, or, or to have a lot of uh, research and development institutes that were uh, main the main pillars at the beginning, but uh, in in the in, uh, uh, 20 years uh, after that, uh, you, ha you have, you, we have uh, a physical infrastructure. We, we have built, we have built, uh, have built a, a physical infrastructure uh, with uh, facilities in order to, to make the integration of the satellites, to, to qualify, to, to testing, to, <coughs> and we have developed, but, but this kind of, uh, with this, the, at, at this moment, in, in the, the middle of the, of the plan, the, the, the physical infrastructure was critical. And with this physical infrastructure, there were other people that was outside of the, of the national space program, very smart people, that took advantage of this kind of infrastructure and, and create a other branch of the, of the national space program, a private branch of the, of the national space uh, program, and in our country started up a lot of new companies in the space sector. Some of them, uh, you know, maybe companies like Satellogic that were incubated in, in the main contractor of the National Space uh, Program and, and other companies. And, and then the physical infrastructure in, 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 in different times were the critical infrastructure were uh, different physical infrastructure factors that, uh, that, that have, have, been, have, been, have been critical uh, in each stage of, of the plan. 
Thank you. And uh, Natavan, on, on the same topic, your, your thoughts, please. Yes. Um, uh, well, I absolutely agree uh, with Guillermo on that. Uh, so, uh, in, at Azure Cosmos, uh, we always ask the question, why? Why we need uh, to do that? And uh, we are always um, uh, taking the example from uh, Simon Sinek Golden Circle. Why, how, and what? We are always trying to answer these questions and then to have uh, the infrastructure, critical infrastructure, in order to enable space ecosystem. So uh, for us, strategy is very important, and clear vision and uh, goals. And based on that, uh, we uh, always uh, understand uh, the capabilities and the resources we have. And meanwhile, uh, also, as uh, Gabriela mentioned, uh, space policy is very important regulatory frameworks. So in order to have very successful uh, space uh, ecosystem in the country, it's very important to have uh, the um, uh, technical skills, capabilities, and also the environment uh, regulatory frameworks that will facilitate uh, this uh, sector, and also the support uh, from the government and the, uh, in terms of uh, fostering uh, private sector uh, in order uh, to have uh, successful uh, business cases. Thank you. Um, moving on then, so we've, we've heard these um, uh, elements of infrastructure that need to be in place, and um, I'd like to address the next question to Ian. Um, Ian, do you think that these elements um, and base infrastructure that we've heard uh, are in place in the Latin American region? And if not, what should be done to bring this about? So, um, speaking for Brazil, right, um, we can say that we have the basic infrastructure there. Um, we have already uh, old and consolidated space program. There are companies in the sector, and there are excellent, excellent courses, uh, for example, in, in uh, aerospace engineering in Brazil. So, the basic structure. I think we have for uh, develop the ecosystem, uh, but the, of course there's there are a lot to do, uh, and still, and that's why we are here, try to understand how it works in another countries to develop in ours. Uh, but I think uh, Brazil is um, in the right track. You know, we we signed the uh, Artem's Accords, we signed an. Um, the technological safeguards uh, agreement with US and we are trying to develop um, the um, Alcantara Base uh, Space Center in Brazil, in the north of Brazil. So to sum up, uh, I think we have a work to do, but we are, I think we are in Brazil in the right track. Thank you. Um, then uh, lo looking at this from the perspective of what can be learned from other regions, uh, we often hear when there's talk of starting regional space programs or initiatives, very often um, uh, the European Space Program or European Space Agency are cited as examples of successful regional cooperation. So my next question is directed at um, uh, Gabriela and Michal. Um, what, what can we learn from the European example. Um, what would you say are some of the, the lessons that could be applied to other regions um, and perhaps things that should be uh, mistakes that were made that should perhaps be avoided uh, in trying to set up a, a regional space ecosystem? And I'm gonna ask you to try and answer this question in two minutes each, please. So let's starting with you, Michal. Thank you, I will try to be positive. Uh, so I would probably say three points here. Uh, firstly, uh, this kind of collaboration uh, allows to pool together not only financial resources but also capabilities, uh, knowledge and talents. And uh, I think that this is uh, really uh, the kind of collaboration, the kind of situation when one plus one equals more than two because of the synergies created. Secondly, this kind of collaboration, taking a look at, at directly at ESA, uh, allows to 
there allows collaboration between uh, countries and stakeholders of different size and maturity, uh, which is uh, also a useful tool uh, for integration of newer members with uh, keeping in mind the, the necessity to have certain mechanisms to make this collaboration just and, and uh, inclusive, but also at the same time efficient. And the third point I would mention is, uh, and especially from perspective of uh, smaller countries as Slovakia, for example, this is a kind of collaboration that allows even smaller members uh, be part and uh, contribute to larger, significant, uh, more costly and, and uh, complex uh, projects and uh, through that be a valuable partner, valuable member of international space community. Thank you. And Gabriela, do you have anything to add to what Michal has just said? Yes, okay. So, um, indeed, uh, uh, the Europe of space uh, uh, is an excellent uh, uh, regional cooperation model, uh, not only for the European countries, but uh, probably for uh, other uh, regions. Uh, let me mention uh, an interesting point. Uh, space uh, in Europe, uh, um, uh, through the uh, uh, international uh, cooperation model uh, of uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, has highly contributed to the identity of uh, uh, Europe. Um, because, uh, uh, indeed, uh, um, space uh, in Europe, the, the, uh, the ESA uh, model, uh, preceded the uh, political uh, integration uh, guided uh, today by the uh, European Union. Uh, mm, uh, because, indeed, uh, in, uh, in ESA, uh, the member state uh, renounced some of the uh, national uh, prerogatives uh, in space science uh, and uh, research uh, in favor of a common uh, policy of uh, programs and, uh, of course, related uh, financial uh, resources. Uh, just uh, I would like to, to, uh, to mention an example, uh, a clear example. For example, uh, in Europe, uh, we have uh, uh, and o uh, only one corp of astronauts. Why? Because uh, uh, some years uh, uh, ago, uh, the member states renounced to have uh, a national corp of astronauts. So today, uh, our astronauts uh, are all uh, European uh, astronauts. So uh, this, uh, uh, this process uh, um, uh, contributed uh, to make Europe uh, uh, a, a global uh, uh, space power uh, today. Thank you. So, moving on now to the role of regulation, um, and, and the next question I'm going to address, I think, jointly to Ian and, and Michal. So, um, Ian, as, as one of the um, space lawyers on the panel, um, what do you think about the role of regulation as a lever to shape a space ecosystem? And uh, to Michal, um, how do you, how does one balance the regulator versus promoter role that government can play to avoid fragmented or divergent governments? So, um, regulatory activity is inherent to state activity, right? However, regulation must be efficient, and in order to preserve the private interest, but at the same time uh, promotes safe and sustainable uh, space environment. In practical, this is difficult. It's uh, to do a um, good regulation is something difficult because, uh, of course, you, you need to, to have this balance between the interests, the private sector and the public sector, right? Especially in the space, because we, we need to, to do this in um, a safe way, like in the aviation sector. So it's, uh, in, in the practical, it's, it's quite hard, you know? 
But in Brazil, uh, and I took some notes here, uh, we have now this um, regulatory impact assessment. This was created uh, uh, two years ago by a federal law in Brazil, and this is a milestone improvement of our regulatory quality from the federal public entities in Brazil. Uh, this is a, a mechanism for decision-making process in the public administration, and of course, in our case, AAB uh, is part of the public, federal public administration in Brazil. And this procedure uh, try to rationalize, rationalize and establish a procedure for the uh, public entities there. So um, the regulatory impact asset uh, is recognized as a good um, administrative practice by uh, OACD. And uh, probably you know Brazil is trying to take part of OACD is, is in our goal and for our government to, to achieve that. So that's why we put uh, this, um, uh, this regulatory impact asset in our national legislation. And in, in, in our case in, in Brazil, we did this, we used this tool uh, when uh, last year uh, we, we, we did our regulation in uh, Brazilian Space Agency for example for authorization procedures for a space launch. So we use this instrument and we put for a uh, public opinion uh, and after that uh, we took this, um, this stuff for uh, students, for professionals, for industry, for everyone, is open to everyone and after that we did our uh, regulation. I think this is a, a good example to, to the right way to do this. Thank you. Yeah, so I must, uh, first of all, completely agree with Ian, and it's uh, foremost about finding the, the equilibrium, finding the best balance between regulation and promotion. Uh, simplify, I, I would say that probably the ideal version of regulation is the regulation that adds as little burden as possible to, to innovators, to businesses and researchers, while at the same time maintaining the order and uh, transparency of the processes. Uh, Over-regulation can definitely be uh, very dangerous for innovation, but at the same time the, the order and transparency must be, must be preserved. One thing that I would like to also point out is that often when talking about the regulation in space area, we mostly focus on space-specific regulation, but it's also about the regulation which is more general to business and, and uh, researchers. So regulation that shapes uh, favorable environment for innovative business in general and uh, research uh, activities in general. And maybe one last point I would like to also mention is the connected topic of uh, standardization and standardization harmonization, and here it's also very interesting example from, from Europe with the uh, joint ECSS standardization, which is basically the backbone for, for collaboration in, in all the projects. So again, one interesting example, getting back to, to your previous question about the, uh, some case studies from, from Europe, it's uh, again uh, something that I would point out here also for the topic of, of regulation. Thank you. And, and perhaps so sort of following this thread a bit further, um, uh, w w I I'm wondering um, what lessons can be applied from no non-space domains to the, the development of a space ecosystem. Greg, your thoughts on that? Sure, that's an excellent question. And <clears throat> I think if we look at uh, what the United States did, for instance, with uh, the Internet, um, <coughs> the United States developed the Internet originally uh, as the ARPANET, a, a military project, and it stayed that way uh, in uh, generally space and military research institutions for, for like three decades until it was decided uh, to be transferred to the National Science Foundation and moved out to the public. And at that time, the government could have done several different things. They could have been the arbitrator of every single uh, domain and decided what sort of content should or should not be allowed and what sort of commerce should or should not be allowed. And, and, and frankly, they, they opened it up. And they also put in a tax moratorium on internet transactions, which allowed 
e-commerce companies in the United States like Amazon to, uh, to flourish. And I would strongly advise that that tax moratorium idea be considered by any country that wants to succeed in space. What you're trying to do is, is develop a huge future. And Bank of America has told us they expect the space economy to be $2.7 trillion in 2040. That's bigger than the entire UK economy. I, I suspect it's bigger than the whole South American economy. I don't know that number. But think about that. You're trying to grow something big in the future that's going to return a lot of value. And as I said at the beginning, the measurement of a successful space sustainable ecosystem is that it returns more value to the planet than it, than it takes from it. So think about that future, not, not the immediate problems and, and, and issues in front of you, and, and, and have the vision to do it. So I, I think we learned that well with, with the internet. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great perspective. Natavan, your, your thoughts on this topic? Uh, yes, in addition to the points mentioned by Greg, uh, I would like to emphasize the roles of uh, business incubation centers, think tanks, and also free, uh, free trade zones, uh, techno parks, as a non space domains uh, enabling space ecosystem. Why? Uh, because uh, if uh, business incubation centers and techno parks have um, uh, great uh, rules and conditions uh, for the new startups uh, to establish uh, their uh, business models, uh, then uh, I believe there will be more uh, business uh, cases and successful ideas to come. And also uh, regarding the research uh, institutions and uh, think tanks, uh, the questions uh, raised by um, uh, international organizations on the use of um, how, how to ease uh, the life on Earth and how to uh, use uh, these uh, limited resources. In that sense, I believe uh, if there is a support uh, by the research institutions, then uh, uh, the people will explore, uh, the youngsters, younger generations will explore uh, the uh, use of uh, space uh, in terms of uh, um, tackling uh, the s social uh, problems and uh, tackling uh, the even uh, climate change and all. Thank you. And Guillermo, as somebody with extensive experience in the industrial e ecosystems in Latin America, do you think there's some um, uh, lessons that can be applied from the non-space sector to developing the sustainable space ecosystem? Um, uh, well, uh, in the landscape of, of Latin America, uh, there are uh, different situations because uh, there are countries like uh, Argentina that, well, that have a, a very well-developed national ecosystem, and there are countries that are uh, at the beginning of this national uh, uh, space program. Um, and maybe, the, too, there are countries that uh, doesn't have uh, the, the main, stronger, strong main pillars, uh, strong main pillars like uh, human resources, uh, research and development institutions, and, and the industrial base. But <coughs> maybe uh, the, this, those can, these countries uh, can, uh, can take advantage of the cooperation in the, in the, region, in the regional uh, space uh, working together with, with, with the other countries and uh, oriented, or, orienting I, I, its policies in order to develop a regional uh, a space ecosystem more than a national space ecosystem uh, uh, taking advantage of the, of the capabilities of, of, the, of the other countries. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and it's interesting how you took sort of a regional perspective in, in your answer. So now I'd like to move on to the, the questions provided by the audience and um, some great questions here and I'd like to um, uh, try and cover as many of them as we can uh, in the time remaining to us. So, um, first question on my list here, is it feasible to have multiple ecosystems with each focusing on selected areas but the combined is an even more sustainable and resilient ecosystem? If so, how? So, I guess um, kind of reading a bit more into that question, combination of you know, establishing national ecosystems and whether that can build into a regional ecosystem. And let's try and, and uh, uh, answer this very quickly in, in just a, a, a minute or two so that we can cover the other questions. Who would like to volunteer for that? Val. Well, maybe, 
Oh, just huh? just yeah. one idea. Uh, maybe we can think in an interconnected m ecosystem, not in national ecosystem or in, in a regional ecosystem, uh, but we can think in an in interconnected ecosystem on in interconnected ecosystems working together. Okay. Um, Greg? Yeah, I'd like to uh, say to that, I'm, not, I'm going to be a skeptic about the regional ecosystem idea. I think, for instance, let's say Ecuador, which has some amazing possibilities as a spaceport location, could probably create great value by teaming with a country like Ukraine af after they drive the Russians out, um, who has amazing capabilities in, in uh, propulsion systems and rockets and avionic uh, design. So it's a global system, uh, and space inherently doesn't see the, the borders or, or regions, and I think we need to think broadly about uh, our global uh, interconnectedness in, in all of these ecosystems being being entwined uh, across borders and regions. Okay. Val, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think in the various interjections, there were, you know, th the ecosystem has different elements. It's not so much the elements, but the interaction between the elements. And I think you put it quite nicely the other day, space is ancillary, it's not mainstream. In a sense that, for example, it supports other policy interventions use space for, like, for the SDGs, uh, education, health, and so yeah. on. So it's not mainstream from a policy perspective, but it supports it. And then the key aspect, whether you're looking at in-country or region, is harmonization. So how do you link the space ecosystem with other sub-ecosystems in, su in, in a national, and we talk about national system of innovation, and that's essential. And space is essentially a subset of the national system of innovation. When you get to the regional level, how do you look at national ecosystem, sub-regional and regional? And that's somewhat more difficult because the political aspects and agendas might be eroding that particular uh, ambition. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. all, all good points. I see we're down to four minutes. I'm going to try and see how, much, um, uh, how many more of these questions we can cover in the time remaining. So the next one is simple gonna be, simply going to be a yes, no, or, or raise your hand uh, kind of question. Do you think the general public should know more about space to build a better space ecosystem? Yes or no? <laughs> the answer yes. is yes. yes. Because yes. You're, paying with, you're playing with taxpayers' money, and then they should know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, then, um, the next one. Building an ecosystem will never be a, a com done, a completed exercise. A healthy ecosystem is always evolving, pivoting to new priorities and needs, and challenging the status quo. Comments on that? Well, I, th I think we would agree on that, right? I mean, you're never gonna be done with building an ecosystem. Michal, you have a? Yes, I can absolutely agree because it's basically always evolving organism, basically, so it needs to adapt to new challenges, adapt to new situations. So, yeah, basically we never reach end of building the ecosystem. Yep, okay. The next one's an interesting one. Do you think that today's societies might have limits to build a su successful space ecosystem? Are there intrinsic limits that um, may, may hold us back? Greg, you have a thought on this? Uh, the, the beautiful thing about space is it, it's, it's limitless. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I, I think that the the, the more we access space, the, the more value we're going to deliver back to our planet. I don't think there are any intrinsic uh, limits within uh, reasonable bounds. Okay. One more. Um, what is the seed for building a space ecosystem? Is it political stability or a space agency or a national satellite program or something else? What's the initial spark or seed that you need? Or can it be all of these things? Not about. Yes, I would like to add on that. From Azerkosmos perspective, uh, the seed was a uh, first satellite program in Azerbaijan. When we started uh, our activities uh, in uh, 2010, uh, it was the initiative from the government to have the first satellite program. And uh, gradually, uh, we added new satellites. And uh, last year, we uh, granted uh, space agency functions. And I believe all those 10 years experience as a satellite operator in Azerbaijan really uh, opened uh, new doors and opportunities uh, for us. So I, I believe the satellite program uh, should be the and might be the seed uh, to have the uh, successful space ecosystem. 
Um, yeah, I think I think that that's been the uh, the experience of quite a number of emerging space countries is that this, a satellite program kind of tends to focus government. I I know in the case of South Africa, for example, it was a small satellite program that got government thinking about all the regulatory and policy stuff to so that it could be properly licensed when it was eventually launched. So thank you for that. Well, our time has caught up with us, um, and I want to set a record by being the first panel in this conference to end, not just on time, but maybe a minute or so before. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists and our keynote speaker. <laughs> Thank you for your attention, for the for this, uh, thought-provoking questions. And also thank you to the conference uh, officers for the amazing support during our session. With that, I conclude the session. Thank you very much. Back to Christian. Thanks, Peter. And thanks to the entire panel. A special thanks to Val, who has not only taught us how to build an ecosystem in space, uh, for space, but also how to solve the cube. So that's, that's a double benefit we got today. Thank you very much. If you could all get together again for the traditional group picture, please. And in, while this is done, I would already like to ask the speakers of our next plenary, the plenary five, to get ready to take their position on stage.